Hey everybody, it is Write the Docs podcast time. My name is Jared Morgan, and uh, I don't know the episode off the top of my head because it's early morning. <laughs> but that's okay, it's 25, there we are. We're, we're, we're surging forward with the episodes, it's fantastic, I love it. So joining me today is the regular cohort. So let's start off in the USA and have a say hello to Tom Johnson. How are you going, Tom? I'm doing well. Thanks, Chris. Or thanks, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. What's what's new over there since last time we talked quickly? Um, you know, uh, nothing. Just really busy at work. That's all. Uh, no exciting news or anything. Oh, I, I shipped off a daughter to college. That's kind of exciting. Uh, that but is other than it, <laughs> uh, things yeah. are things are going well. Well, that's good. As long as things are going well, then that's very good. All right, over to Berliner, and it is Chris Ward. Hello, Chris. How are you doing, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it had to be carried through. I, yeah. I respect the I respect the he- coherence. It's excellent. Uh, this early in the morning, it is five thirty here, and I haven't had coffee yet. So uh, any any, <laughs> any anything to keep me awake is a good thing. It's very good. Now, we actually have a, a, a special guest with us today, which is excellent. It's always good to have people on other than Chris and Tom and me. So um, I'd like to introduce today Andrew Head. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm really excited to be on the show. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, <laughs> now, uh, the, the way we got to know you is actually Tom uh, um, introduced us to you. And, uh, and I might actually throw over to Tom now to uh, tell us a bit more about how that happened. So, Tom, take it away. Sure. I was reading an article uh, called When Not to Comment, Questions and Tradeoffs with API Documentation for C++ Projects. And Andrew Head is one of the uh, main authors here. I think there are four authors. But uh, uh, it's an amazing project that I was, I was actually blown away by. Um, really quite an extensive look at how people find and use uh, code at Google. Uh, I've partnered with a lot of people. So, Andrew, can you just tell us a little bit first about yourself, uh, wh- where you're at, what you're doing, and about this, the, the project that this article was, was written for? Sure. So, um, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. So, I've been there for about five years or so doing graduate level research on all kinds of topics that are related to how programmers and scientists share their expertise with each other. And one of the main focuses of all of my research over the course of these last five years is documentation. I realized during my own stints uh, as a programmer and a software developer that while there's a ton of research that goes into computer science education and how you teach uh, programmers in these formal contexts, a lot of the learning that happens on the job is from engaging with documentation and code that other programmers have written. And I wanted to help advance what we do about how to improve the experience of programmers being able to learn from each other while they're working on the job. So uh, fast forward a few years into my PhD, um, I was talking with Caitlin Sadowski and Emerson Murphy Hill, who were doing some uh, engineering research at Google. And uh, we were interested in spending a little bit of time together working on studying documentation, um, specifically in the context of Google. Um, I can't speak on behalf of Google today, but I can certainly speak on behalf of the research that we have put out from that project. And the main thing that led us to working on this project was that um, at Google, there is a code search tool that's used by 20,000 developers every day. And it's instrumented, there's log information uh, that's collected through this code search uh, engine. And so this provided us with an interesting opportunity to ask, what all can we learn from documentation and what's in it and what's missing from it and how people navigate it by using telemetry from this code search engine as a, as a way to kind of start digging into the, the code searching and document ter- searching experience. And so this led to the project that was in that paper, which has several different parts of it. Part of it is looking at that telemetry data. Part of it is then conducting interviews with searchers uh, 
based on uh, these uh, certain transitions that we observed that we thought might lead us to finding uh, missing information in the documentation. And then in kind of the third stage of the pipeline, talking to some of the maintainers of the APIs and the code to ask them what their thoughts were on the documentation and the questions that people had about the code and its comments as they were navigating it. I'm happy to dig any deeper into each of those three parts, but essentially we just had this opportunity in front of us where we had a bunch of cool telemetry data and this was our exploration of what all we could find out from it. Yeah, hey, I, I want you to unpack this giant uh, multi-billion line code base that that is at Google <laughs> because I think it's somewhat unique. Uh, as as I was, you know, reading through this article, you, you wrote that they they write code in a multi-billion dollar code base using a shared infrastructure that is frequently updated. Uh, so they frequently browse and navigate the source code using a, a code search tool. Is this a unique setup at tech companies, or is this something that's also done at Facebook or something? Having one massive mono repo for all of code that people just search for to see if what they're looking for already exists? Is this common? <laughs> to my understanding, the scale of it at Google is unique just because of the sheer amount of code. Uh, Rachel Potvin, I think, and several other authors wrote a paper that's in the communications of the ACM a couple years ago. I can't remember the exact name of it, but I can share it with you all uh, after the show, where it describes the whole monorepo infrastructure at Google and the design decisions that went into creating uh, this, this repository. And so almost all of the code that's developed at Google ends up going into the singular repository that's indexed through this code search engine. The code search engine has cross-linking, so those kinds of affordances that you have in an IDE that allows you to, for instance, click on a function and go to its definition, all of that stuff is built into this code search engine. Um, and so uh, you're right, it's uh, at least from the perspective of a PhD student who spends most of their time working solo on a project and has spent time in a couple of companies that have maybe a dozen or so separate repos, this idea of having all of this code that's actually kind of connected and collected all into a central place uh, made for a kind of a really interesting place to run the study. Yeah, that is, that is it is cool. I mean, I imagine it must be fun to search in there and see what you can find. Um, you focused on C++ and you, you looked at three different sources header files, implementation files, and G3 doc uh, dis files. Uh, what, what source did you conclude was the go-to place that developers look for information? Yeah, so what we found was, I think one of the important contextual kind of pieces of understanding um, that I know many of the other people on the team had going into this and that I learned uh, during my first experiences working with engineers at Google is that oftentimes code can be the authoritative source for answering questions about APIs. Um, one of the reasons for this is because they have this code search tool, which is cross-linked, uh, pretty easy to navigate. Um, and uh, as we were talking to some of the searchers, we also learned that there's, in some cases, finding an answer to how an API behaves, for instance, what it returns given a certain set of inputs, can be pretty easily inferred from the code. In other cases, it might require you to step uh, several functions inwards before you start getting an answer, and at some point you might get lost, and that's the point at which you kind of really would need documentation in order to answer your questions. And another thing that we also started to realize is that Part of the equation of where you look for the for answers to these questions also depends on the project itself. And so um, internally at Google, you have some of these APIs that are used by thousands of people in all kinds of different projects. And these ones tend to have a great amount of resources poured into writing the documentation and comments for them. And then you have things that are APIs that have been written kind of within a team or maybe across teams, but there's only a few people using it. And maybe it's even been a couple of months since someone or a couple of years since someone has really maintained it before. And so at those points, uh, some of the searchers that we talked to 
we're talking about how there's kind of a trust issue around the comments about whether they actually reflect what the code is really doing. And so in those cases, if you're starting to think that this isn't one of the most stable APIs of the company, you might prioritize looking at the code rather than the comments as a kind of more trustworthy source of truth. One thing, um, I guess, uh, one, I, I, think that, I think the important thing is when you think about the places where searchers are looking for answers to their questions, we actually at one point, point blank, just asked searchers in the current search engine positioning. Uh, I, I, guess I, I guess I can give a little bit more context here um, in order to kind of ground what I'm about to say. So um, the cool thing that we did to try to get to the bottom of some of the API questions that searchers were asking was in C++, there's this notion of header files and C++ files. Header files have a specification for the APIs. So they show the, a function name and the arguments that it takes and the return values. And then it al also you often have the kind of high level comments that describe what this function does and, uh, and what, it, what it does and how it transforms the inputs into the outputs. Meanwhile, you have, that's in your header, your .h files. And then you have your implementation files, which are your .cc files, which are the other type that you described. That's where all of the code is. Uh, so you'll have the duplicated function header in that, and then you'll have all of the code that actually does the transformation of those arguments into the outputs. And so it was our, we, we thought long and hard about how can we get a sense of where the documentation might be missing uh, with a high level of accuracy. And so the thing that we tried was listening for when people went from a header file in C++ to an implementation file. Uh, trying to uh, think that this would give us uh, some way of understanding when someone, when someone hasn't found everything that they want in the high level documentation and needs to dig deep into the nitty gritty details. So long story short, we ended up asking people when they were making that transition, point blank, are you looking for an answer that would best show up in the header file? So in kind of the, the reference, in the CC file, which is the implementation, or in what we call the G3 doc, which was uh, Google's internal markdown server, where most of their high level project documentation was written that wasn't specific to kind of API members. And at this particular moment in time, about two thirds of the time, developers wanted to find the answers in headers, header files. And the rest of the time, they wanted to find them in implementation of files or G3 docs. I think there's like a lot of interesting things there. I, I don't think that's an answer that says that like everything that's documented in Google's context or like another company's context should be in a header file. But I think it does mean that when someone is in this mode of looking for specific answers within a header file, it would really be convenient if it was just there in that initial place that they were looking before they started to have to dig deeper into the code itself. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. It looks like you have a question, Chris. No, I just wondered, did you do any research into finding out if there was any difference between the, the sort of level of experience someone had with the code base and then where they looked? Uh, because not everyone would necessarily know where to look, so they might look for the higher level content first. But if they'd been there five, ten years, then they would probably go straight to the code because they knew where to look. That's a really good question. And we just didn't have access to that information about expertise level of the searchers, but that would be a really cool way to slice and dice that information. Uh, I'm curious about, um, it seems like for a lot of C++ documentation, most people render out a Doxygen file that, or a Javadoc like file that has this auto generated display of the documentation, but that doesn't seem to be something that was common in this code search tool. What, why don't these people who create C++ APIs generate out a Doxygen file with the documentation? So I think like many other companies, there have been different attempts of documentation systems to use. And so my, my own perspective on Doxygen and Java Docs and those types of documentation tools is that there's 
So the value of those tools is they take all of these, all of this documentation that you've written as these comments that are anchored to the code itself, and they get the central location where you can view them kind of all and click on particular classes and they'll take you to other classes and so on and so forth. Um, because all of that cross-linking already exists in the code search tool, it's almost kind of redundant to have something like a Doxygen tool that's then going to render this into HTML and then needs to be um, kind of opened in a separate browser from the code. If you have all of that cross-linking between the API members, uh, as long as someone is capable of tolerating the fact that they're going to have to look within the comments in order to see those Doxygen style comments, we'll have to kind of mentally parse through those like at param, at return value annotations, then it's basically an equivalent experience to Doxygen or Javadocs. So specifically why they don't use them, but I can say that I think that the current code search solution already shares a lot of the affordances that you would get from running these through a Doxygen or Javadoc renderer. But just, just to get my head around how this looked, um, when people were searching the code, were they literally just searching, were they not searching something that was partially rendered anyway? Or were they just searching in the same way that I would search in Visual Studio or something like that? <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's basically equivalent to the way that you would search in Visual Studio. Okay. I'm trying to think if there's any, any real difference um, I know if you're if if anyone who's who's listening to this is is interested in giving it a try, I know that at least as of a couple of years ago, the Chromium uh, the Chromium code base has an open source version of the code search engine, and so you can see all of the cross linking right there. Uh, there might be some additional additional stuff in terms of how you're allowed to kind of uh, enter queries and you know, specific tags that you're trying to use. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't really remember, but uh, a lot of it just boils down to basic code navigation that you would see in kind of a Visual Studio or Eclipse integrated development environment. I think I could actually see the, um, the Chromium version of the code search, search tool. I think it was noted as figure one in the, um, uh, the article, because uh, I can see the, the characteristic little blue Chrome uh, thing there. So. <laughs> Yeah, I can, right. see, I can see an example of that, and we'll we'll link that in in the uh, show notes as well. The uh, the link to your article, so you can read through it in depth because it's a it's got so much information in it that we probably won't have a chance to cover in the show today. But it's super in depth and great read. Um, so yeah, um, so I was looking at the the front of the article, and I think the thing that really jumped out at me is that it was. I think something to the order of, yeah, so 274 of 601 survey developers reported they had missing poor, they had troubles when they had missing poor documentation for an API. Um, and that that's your one third, I guess, isn't it, of developers that really, they put that up as, as one of the highest things that causes them problems when they're trying to use an API. Um, so that was a pretty surprising step, and it adds a lot of weight, I think, to to the importance of documentation for for APIs, and, and not just documentation, but good documentation. I think there was a bit of um, information in your um, article about the the different types of documentation that the developers were expecting. Was that right, or did I misread? Um, so part of that is uh, we. Um, I think the the place where we start to tease apart the different types of documentation are, oh yeah, okay, yeah. Um, there's there's specifically this one uh, this one uh, experience sampling survey that we asked when people were making these transitions from header to implementation files, where we asked them about the the types of questions that they had about the APIs that they were looking to learn more about, and so these kind of fall into your different categories of documentation of kind of low level documentation and high level documentation and kind of design documentation about the code. I'm not sure if we group it together in that way within the paper, but um, you can very much see these different concerns that are often 
being that are often answered by different types of documentation. You know your inputs and your outputs versus your typical usage patterns versus the side effects and implementation details of the code. We saw evidence of a little bit of each of those types of uh, API questions in that experience sampling survey. And sometimes people wanted those answered in the markdown G3 doc files, and sometimes people wanted those answered in the header files. Mm -hmm. um, just out of interest, before we kind of panic everybody watching and listening, <laughs> was, did, did you know uh, the, the comments? and Because the, the, I'm, I'm imagining from my experience of some C style code bases that it's the the code is it, well okay let's let's caveat my question with a pre question were people <laughs> reading the functions themselves or were they reading the comments around the functions or both 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 of those both. are available uh, okay. in the yeah so, so in the header so file my second is, question oh yeah was, sorry who who wrote the comments <laughs> ah um well Developers, uh, <laughs> well, actually, that's uh, that's that's another one of those that, that's another one of those cases where uh, it depends on the project. So um, these comments were either written by a solo developer or written by a team of developers. I know some of the APIs did have technical writers that were assigned to them, and so in some cases. They were written, if not by a technical writer, with the assistance of a technical writer, though there was a huge variance across that spectrum depending on the, the API. Okay. Okay. So we don't have to panic quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you panic? <laughs> well, we kind of, it's making it sound like we're not very useful. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think the thing to me is uh, um, that. The, the realization of this project is that there's just so much stuff to document <laughs> in like uh, in any sized tech technology company. And so if you dig a little bit into into our conversations with maintainers, for instance, there is there are these economic questions that go into what gets documented at any particular time. Is it time for this project to kind of really shine? Have we gotten past? Has it gotten to a kind of mature enough stage? where our comments and our documentation will have staying power? Um, is this something that uh, users uh, and clients of the API won't be able to infer on their own uh, by just looking at the, the kind of uh, the API uh, function itself? Um, and so there are all of these questions that go into whether or not to document a particular thing, which is why the paper is called When Not to Comment. It's because okay, yeah. in some cases, uh, you know, maintainers opt not to comment for these very kind of legitimate reasons, but it's also sometimes at this tension of the searchers who are already using that <laughs> that API and could sometimes use additional usage information. Hey, Andrew, I've got a question about um, combining reference content with like conceptual content. Um, and I think my my understanding is that the G three doc is going to have more of the conceptual stuff, right? right whereas That's the the other the header files and implementation files has more of the reference. In a larger uh, sense of the question, people frequently ask, "Hey, I've got this auto generated Doxygen file. I want to make it seamless with the rest of my documentation, my tutorial oh. conceptual docs. Yeah. How do you merge these two, or should they be merged? Should they be kept separate?" That's a great question. <laughs> That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I've I've studied documentation and documentation tools for a pretty long time now. And I'm not sure I've seen any solution yet that will integrate together conceptual documentation and reference documentation. And some of the theoretical work that's been done within computer science and empirical software engineering about programming documentation does put this divide between uh, what's sometimes called conceptual documentation and reference documentation, what's sometimes called high-level documentation and low-level documentation. And they're usually considered these two separate entities. Um, I, think, I think one of the most fun things about this project 
is that when we were asking people about these API questions and they were coming up and oftentimes saying that they were looking for these answers about implementation details in the header files, which are things that usually don't go in the header files, it starts to blur this boundary between when documentation goes where um, and where would be most convenient to surface some of this. I think another really important consideration in combining together conceptual documentation and reference documentation is um, one, of the, one of the huge evils in code is um, the dry principle, don't repeat yourself, uh, avoiding from duplicating code in multiple places. Um, and similarly, duplicating the logic where you describe that code in multiple places means that when you change it in one place, it might become out of sync in another place too. So similarly, your conceptual documentation and your reference documentation are going to provide these two separate views on the same code and the same behavior. And are you always going to remember to change both of them if you're describing the same thing in both of them? That's one potential danger to maintenance. So it's like this big, tricky problem. Um, and I think it's a great question. And I don't know. I guess I get maybe maybe it's uh, right for someone to explore uh, whether so there's a good way to uh, uh, integrate is the two together. There's one tool that sort of does it. There's a tool I've used on a C sharp code base uh, called DocFX, which is made by Microsoft. Um, oh, sort cool. of, it's maintained by Microsoft, sort of, um, which kind of lets you merge uh, Swagger, and it is Swagger, not OpenAPI at the moment. They're still updating to version three. Uh, C sharp um, function comments and conceptual documentation. Sort oh. of, you can you can do a lot of like mushing together, but its own documentation is is pretty, pretty <laughs> <laughs> average. So it's sometimes quite hard to figure out how to do it effectively. But it is sort of possible, and I have done it a little bit with one of the projects I work on. But um, yeah, it's also limited to C sharp. So, <laughs> but uh, it's it's sort of possible with that. Yeah. So but somebody even, wants... even though it's sort of possible, I'm not even entirely sure if I have gone down that path of thinking I want to merge it all and then getting to the point of thinking, do I actually want to? So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Uh, there's a, so in the, in the academic research world, there's this uh, obscure, I, I guess I think, it's, I think it's pretty obscure outside of academia. It's called elucidative, elucidative programming. Uh, and it's it, it sounds kind of like this docfx thing where you're capable of embedding kind of snippets of code or certain kind of reference pieces of code directly in the documentation and providing some stable link between the two of them. And so I think that's it's it's one of those great ideas that's like been around for for a while, but you just kind of it, I think it's waiting to find its like key uh, key language key use case. And then at some point, I'm sure the veil will be lifted from our eyes and we'll be like, oh, that's, that's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> One takeaway I, I really get from just reading this article is the value of making sure that the code is annotated well, right? Uh, whether it's the formal annotations or the other comments, because I mean, the thrust of the article is like when you, when you don't comment, when you just let developers sort of read the, the code raw, and most, most of the times, um, at least in my experience, engineers write the reference docs, hand the technical writer an output, a Java doc or Doxygen file, and then the technical writer just focuses on the conceptual material. Hmm. In reality, like a lot of the comments in that, that reference output are what developers are reading. We should probably not you know, just take it so lightly and just push it out, right? It should be domain where we try to understand as well. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And I think oftentimes this conceptual stuff is you just cannot be divorced from the API level documentation. So I think one of the cases that we talked about in the paper was uh, when two of the cases, one of them was uh, talking about, for, for instance, the, the performance of hash maps. And another case was uh, how a threading library or a futures library worked. And in those cases, there's some execution model stuff that people have to understand and some runtime performance stuff that people have to understand to kind of really use it to its full advantage and make sure not to run into any gotchas. 
And uh, so in those cases, it's when people are looking at, you know, the constructors and the function calls that oftentimes they're going to be asking some of these questions. Uh, and so in that case, if you had a uh, someone, if you had a technical writer who would come up with this awesome way of describing something in technical documentation, but API member uh, uh, API member comments, then I think that would be well, it would probably be a bit of a pity. Yeah, that this whole topic is actually quite relevant to me right now. I have um, one project has a very small C++ library of three functions. And basically, I just I was just kind of digging into the header files and extrapolating out the logic to put these three pages in my docs. Um, but there's another project. It's not my project, but people were asking me about it. has 1,400 pages of C++ documentation. And they're cool. like, how do we get this on our developer portal? I'm like, <laughs> you, you, you're going to try to pull it out of the the doxygen output like what it, yeah people are really spinning their wheels and and i mean if you had if you had 1400 pages of of c++ documentation like what would what high level strategies would you sort of uh follow about this like how would you even go about this if they say hey andrew we've got this mountain of c++ docs we know that you're an expert on this how do we make this you know <laughs> great great documentation what would you do or say Wow, um, I think I think this is a role I'd rather leave to the technical writers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I I know for sure that as as a person who uses APIs and writes a lot of code, there's the there's the onboarding experience to starting out with an API where you start with looking for some simple examples and trying to understand the capabilities and the limitations of the library. And then, and then at some point you start digging deeper into that API reference documentation. I mean, I think ideally for something that has 1400 pages worth of C++ documentation, any particular person is only gonna have to look at about 10 pages of that in order to accomplish the goals that they have. And so your goal is to make it such that they're capable of getting to those 10 pages of it uh, without having to look at the other 1,390 of them. Uh, so, and, and in that case, I mean, I think that's just squarely technical, good technical writing, you know, providing good example use cases that are gonna match up closely to the terms that people are gonna be using. If, you, um, if you're designing a new library, making sure that it follows the conceptual model of other libraries that people have used in the past so that they can do pattern matching uh, when they're looking for the relevant API members to use. Um, and uh, yeah, and I guess having documentation that's good enough that people can also filter out the things that very quickly appear not relevant uh, when they, if they have to at some point just resort to an exhaustive search <laughs> through the available functionality. So I guess I, I don't really, I, I, I'm not sure that I have uh, super solid research groundings for those suggestions, but I can say that I, I think that that those tend to be APIs that follow those guidelines tend to be at least the easiest for me to use. Can you tell us a little bit about your other projects? I know this this one paper is just like a, a small uh, sample of your output. You're you're building tools. You're doing lots of active research. You seem one of the most. You seem like one of the most active sort of researchers in this API doc space. What are you, what are you currently doing and working on? So um, there's a couple of other, there's three other projects right now that I've worked on related to APIs and documentation that are in progress in one way or another in some of the research that I'm doing. One of these projects was called Tutorons. And so the, the word Tutoron is like a, atom of a tutorial. That's kind of what the, the etymology of that particular word is. Uh, atom of a programming tutorial. And uh, we were trying to, one thing, I guess um, one challenge for anybody who writes a tutorial or anybody who writes technical documentation is that at some point you have to make some assumptions about what your audience knows and, uh, uh, and essentially the technical competencies that they're going to bring with them to engaging with that piece of documentation. Um, and so that means that sometimes you leave out details, you leave out explanations that would potentially be helpful to them just to make the document more concise and manageable and keep from getting too bogged down. 
And so the idea behind tutorons was, what if you had these automatic routines that could detect pieces of code within tutorials and then provide potentially the missing explanations on demand to users of uh, notation and, uh, and, and functions and syntax that they might not necessarily have seen before. And so uh, in, this, in that particular project, we designed one for uh, Unix command line, and we designed one for CSS selectors and one for regular expressions. It essentially just goes and detects in web pages instances of these languages and provides these context relevant on-demand explanations of the code that's in it. For instance, writing a natural language description of a CSS selector saying, this is going to choose divs with the class uh, button from uh, divs with the class of container uh, for, for you know, a CSS selector that's just dot container dot button. So uh, that's one of the projects that, that I've worked on. Another one is called Code Scoop. And uh, this one is, uh, that project is uh, a little bit less on the technical writer and a little bit more on the programmer as documenter side of things in that um, oftentimes, you know, sometimes technical writers are producing this documentation. Sometimes it's programmers creating these usage examples uh, from their own work, maybe sending them to each other over chat or putting them into kind of an early version of documentation. And so, um, but, but in order to make a good usage example, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of work that goes into simplifying code. Uh, you strip out a bunch of the irrelevant details and you provide just a good set of example data that's simple enough, uh, simple but interesting enough for someone to be able to, uh, uh, to, to engage someone and to convince them that they can use the, those APIs in their, in their own cases. And so the idea behind CodeScoop is um, we, given a selection of a few lines of code, we help extract a bit of other scaffolding from the rest of code that's going to be necessary to run that example. And then we also allow people to make these simplifications along the way to the code example. For instance, substituting runtime data that was passing through the program for variables or objects that might have made the code more complicated and just substituting it out with literals to make kind of a nice, simple, concrete usage example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then uh, the last project, the last direction that I'm working on these days is in computational notebooks. Um, so uh, if for, for anyone who's not familiar with computational notebooks, um, the most common computational notebook is called Jupyter Notebook. And, uh, and uh, Jupyter Notebooks and computational notebooks embody this idea behind programming documentation called literate programming, which is where you intersperse code, uh, executable code, with descriptions of what that code does. So you essentially make kind of a, a readable program uh, by instead of having comments, you have markdown blocks above and below it, and you can nest outputs right after the code. Um, and this has just this this medium has just taken off for data scientists in recent years. Uh, Jupyter Notebook, for instance, estimates it has like six million users or something like that. And so um, there's a lot of interesting questions about how you effectively present ideas in computational notebooks, and also this, this huge issue of helping people clean up their experimental code that they've written in these notebooks into a readable document for other people. And so uh, we built this tool, the set of tools called code gathering tools for computational notebooks that, uh, similar to CodeScoop, you get to select a couple of results or a couple of computations within your notebook, and then it straightens everything and it cleans out a bunch of the irrelevant junk to provide a kind of linearized, concise version of the code that you used to produce a result. Uh, and so uh, these are all kind of active areas that I'm continually working in, and I think just kind of represent ongoing challenges with the, the very hard problem of writing pro programming documentation. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah. That's a lot I've of heard... subjects that really get me interested there. But anyway, yeah, sorry, Jared. <laughs> I was going to say, look, I've, I've heard Jupyter Notebooks being thrown around as a, as a tool that people use, but I've never really understood why it was so important. But it sounds incredibly powerful as a, as a way to actually document things. So that's, that's something I'm going to have to look into, I think, because, <laughs> yeah, it sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's something it's... that I, I'm a huge fan of kind of interactive documentation, but the... As far as I know, Jupyter is still Python 
only or has that changed or I believe Jupyter actually supports many languages now. Oh, okay, cool. But there is a difference in how well it actually supports mm. typical programming tasks in those. So Python works really well because oftentimes people in data science scripts, you're submitting, uh, you're essentially executing these chunks of code one after another uh, with something like, uh, let's say you're programming a web server, for instance. In that case, you have a bunch of really intricately linked code that fits together in these weird structures that doesn't necessarily get split super well within a computational notebook. And so computational notebooks, Jupyter, Jupyter now supports many different languages, perhaps also including like uh, certain versions, certain types of interactive Java and C. Uh, though once you start to get a level of architectural complexity around a project, I think that's where it starts uh, that's 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 where people haven't really figured out the right way to port the paradigm. I think. Mm. Hey, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sort of uh, blown away, uh, just like my colleagues here on on these <laughs> these these projects that you're doing, in part because so many academics, in, at least in techcom, tend to not be very technical. Like, it, it, in order to ramp up and and become you know, uh, well-read and scholarly on on super, you know, arcane matters, very detailed matters. You sort of have to sacrifice that technical edge. Um, but you seem to both be scholarly and super technical. Do you find these to be hard to to maintain both both of those areas? Like, it, are there a lot of highly technical scholars in your area? Yeah. So. When it comes to documentation and programming communication, you'll see that there's like a few different communities of, of, of scholars who intersect with this research area. And the one that I'm most typically in is within computer science. And so the people who get into the graduate programs and go on to kind of being uh, professors and that kind of stuff have had to get through some type of programming uh, programming program in order to get to that point. They aren't necessarily professional software engineers, but usually like hacking on things. And so, uh, you know, I think I think for me, um, the most fun projects are the ones where I can try to embody some kind of idea about how things could work better in some type of tool, even if it doesn't necessarily work perfectly because this stuff type takes a lot of time to build. But, um, you know, I... Um, Within, within my, my grad program, I've taken a lot of human-computer interaction coursework. And, and one of the main ideas behind all of this is that uh, but behind a lot of human-centered design is that prototypes teach you a lot about tools and people's needs. And uh, they also produce, they essentially distill down certain dis design insights into something that might have uh, <laughs> that might be able to persist longer than your memory <laughs> of those design insights. Um, and so uh, and, and so I think for, for each of my projects and for a lot of the other people in my circle in computer science, this idea of building some type of prototype that even if not perfect can kind of embody some of these ideas is very much a goal of the work. I'll also mention that like I'm not the only person who does work in this space too. Uh, so for instance, um, there's like Steve Oney from the University of Michigan and Thomas Latoza from uh, George Mason University and Philip Guo uh, from uh, UC Davis uh, and, uh, and Martin Robillard from, uh, I think it's McGill University and, and a bunch of other people and, and all of their PhD students who uh, to varying degrees do this kind of empirical level research and then trying to embody it in some type of tool. Um, that, you know, I, I'm not sure that we're always the best about kind of communicating this stuff back to the larger communities, but I think, um, once again, just trying to get get some of this this understanding of, of these problems and ideas about future workflows um, into, into some type of prototype tool. I I've certainly have more questions, but I'm conscious, Jared, do you have that? <laughs> no, look, I'm actually looking through the, the back half of the article and I'm looking at the um, results and context. But if you've got more um, uh, questions up front there, Chris, it might be good. And we might see if we can roll it, so round out the show with some of those results and context. Okay. So I was, I was <clears> interested, I think, two two questions that I feel like are closely connected, but we'll see. Um, 
One, you might have said this at the very beginning, and I might have just forgotten in the sea of information we've discussed, but um, <laughs> why did you get, how, why and how did you get into this in the first place? Because it seems somewhat kind of, I don't know, my involvements with academia are fairly limited, but it, it seems niche. And secondly, <laughs> you've mentioned you're all PhD students. And as far as I'm aware in the US, it's the same as many other countries. PhD students often have to be funded by somebody. So who, who is funding this kind of research? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I think, the, I think the research is kind of niche. Uh, what led me to this research is, so I did a brief stint as a software engineer between the time that I left my undergrad program and then started my graduate program. And one of the things that I was surprised by is how much of my, how much of the learning experience of being a programmer just relied on reading and engaging with these materials that a whole lot of other people had put online and probably weren't even necessarily aware that I was reading. Um, and the fact, and essentially just the realization that once a software developer is out of their undergraduate program or whatever type of formal training that they have, a great deal of what they're going to learn is going to be from reading posts on Stack Overflow, uh, learning by just engaging with other people's code, reading through documentation, looking at lessons that other people have put together just out of, you know, in their free time for fun, and realizing that I thought that putting together these types of materials was actually rather time consuming and really difficult. And maybe there was something I could do to try to kind of slightly lower the threshold <laughs> to trying to produce high quality learning materials. And, um, and so that's essentially been the, the motivation for me throughout my PhD is like, how can we explore this whole idea of the experience about learning about code and computational concepts while people are like on the job and are there tools that we can equip uh, creators with in order to kind of, you know, in either either help them produce new types of documentation or produce existing types of them uh, more easily. Mm -hmm. So that was the motivation. And uh, my funding has come through uh, two sources so far. So um, when I started my PhD, uh, my uh, one of the uh, PIs that I'm working with, his name is Bjorn Hartman. He had an NSF, uh, uh, Natural, Na National Science Foundation grant for conducting research into how programmers exchange their expertise and had some extra slots for people to work on. And so I hopped on that for a year. And then I, uh, the following year, and this is what got me through the rest of my PhD so far, um, the Department of Defense uh, in the United States funds this program called NDSEG, which I think stands for uh, the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship. And so um, I pointed out in my application, I pointed out the fact that code reuse is like a really important thing to, <laughs> to national security interests. So for instance, code reuse across different branches of, uh, of across different branches of government, um, this is not only within defense, but also within all of the different administrations. Um, it's, it's something that the government had actually been taking recent efforts to try to produce new ways of sharing code um, and helping people. And of course, anything, <laughs> just given the amount of technical code that needs to be written for a government to function, uh, to help people be able to understand code and to be able to reuse code without bugs is a very important problem. And so I pointed out this problem and the fact that a lot of this research that I'm doing goes to aiming towards satisfying that goal. And apparently they thought it was worthwhile enough to fund me for three years worth of PhD research. Uh, and so that's where that, <laughs> that's where that amount of research has come from. Um, and uh, I've also been lucky to along the way also work with you know Google for that summer and also uh, Microsoft Research a little bit ago and all of them also have these vested interests in making sure that uh, you know developers are happy <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of another source of support 
Wow, so that's that's very good. It's it's great that so many people are willing to support these sort of studies, and, and the businesses are actually you know willing to support this sort of research because it seems that you know from the results that you actually got from the uh, from the study, there's there's a few takeaways here that um, resulted from. I just wonder if you might round out the show with a few of those uh, insights um, as as a overall thing. So it looks like you've got. Um, uh, in the 5.1 section implications um, there's a few things there's implications for maintainers and there's um, you know also implications for tool builders as well and I think a lot of the time uh, developers that make a tool I, I question whether sometimes they do this type of deep research to actually work out what the problems are that they're trying to solve and I'm just wondering if perhaps they should actually look to academia a little bit more when they're actually doing the, the use case and the justifications for these tools because mm -hmm. it seems that a lot of the really hard work getting to the point where you understand the problem is actually done in academia here rather than actually, you know, interviewing uh, users of the, the product or, you know, that sort of thing that often product managers do. So um, what do you think the biggest takeaway for tool builders would be? Um, from this study? Yeah, so I think the biggest takeaway for tool builders is, so I would recommend for tool builders to take a look at our paper. I think it's table two. Uh, let me just take a look. Yeah, in table two, we distilled down this set of nine API usage questions that we observed happening in the wild as people were going from these header files to the implementation files. And I think for us, we realized that a lot of these tools that are being built to help programmers answer questions about code are focusing on just a couple of these questions that oftentimes are somewhat easy or straightforward to answer, but other questions in terms of helping programmers understand the usage of uh, the, the kind of ideal use cases of an API or helping them dive deeper and answer these questions about side effects and implementation details of APIs. Oftentimes these things are really hard to answer people's questions about if you're building some type of static analysis tool or if you're building some type of code navigation tool or even if you're trying to link from documentation into code. These are some like really tricky issues uh, that are are hard to support, and I don't think that they get a whole lot of tool support. And so I guess where I would direct tool builders is to just say, hey, if you're looking for an interesting new problem to work on, you should go to table two in our paper <laughs> and take a look at it and see how many people were hoping to find some of these answers anchored in, uh, in, in the specifications for this code within the code search interface uh, and see if you can provide better tools for people to find those answers right in those places where they're looking for them. Yeah, I think that sounds like great advice. I'm reading through some of the, um, the, the questions in that table, and yeah, I think there's some very good open-ended questions that the, um, the tool builders could actually use there. So yeah, I, I would agree with that <laughs> wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I think it brings us to the end of, of the show. I think we, we probably do have more questions to, to ask, but I think we're, we're probably out of, the, out of time in, in the slot we have, which is a good problem to have because it means that it's a really interesting topic. And, and uh, look, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show, Andrew. It's been great having you. You're, you're an engaging, uh, engaging guest to have on, and, um, and there's lots of information that you've given us today. So what I'd recommend folks do is um, if you'd like to follow up any of these questions, just go and have a look at the paper that we link in the show notes um, of, of this episode because it's, as I said before, very detailed and it's got a lot of great information that you can digest in your own time. Um, but uh, um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible piece of work. The, the re I really haven't had a lot of um, exposure to research like this, but... It, it, it's blowing my mind the depth that you've gone into. So th thank you for your research in this area. It's 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 fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks thanks Andrew. <laughs> thanks for uh, coming on to the show and also for all the research. It, it is pretty amazing and it's it's somewhat unique. I mean, there's so many technical writers that are just hungry to learn best practices for API documentation. And a lot of times we look in the wrong places. We look in mm. tech com journals. And in reality, this <laughs> com computer science area really has a lot more depth. And, and oh, wait, uh, wait, you mean you mean our users, our actually end users, know best? What? Who <laughs> yeah. would have thought? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Well, uh, thank you. Thank you all, too. I am just tickled to be on the show. <laughs> well, look, uh, <laughs> that, that is the uh, the end of the show now. So we'll go through the uh, the usual things that we do at the end of the show. And that's talking about how to get in touch with us. So uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, there's a number of ways you can do it. You can go to the podcast.writethedocs.org website where we have different methods to get in touch with us. But probably the most reliable method um, to reach out to us is to um, join the podcast channel uh, on Write the Docs Slack and send us a message there. Um, and we, we keep an eye on that that particular channel fairly well so if you want to come on the show and talk about something like andrew's done or if you want to propose an idea for the show that we can look into and see if we can find guests for please do it because it's great to have the the interaction for the show and and to hear from the community about what they want to hear uh, on the podcast because it is after all for the community um so if you'd like to contact any of the uh the guests on the show today you can reach chris at uh chris chinch let's say it's c-h-i-n-c-h uh on twitter uh tom is just tom johnson on twitter um i'm jared morgs on twitter and andrew do you have a way of uh, folks contacting you um on social media sure uh so i have a twitter handle which is drew mike head and you can also send me an email at andrewhead at berkeley.edu. No, terrific. That'll be great. All right. Thank you very much. So I think that that is officially the end of the show. So um, thanks again for everyone uh, joining and um, for you there listening as well. Uh, it's great uh, to, to have you. And um, as we always do at the end of the show, remember, docs or it didn't happen. <laughs>